Since the creation of the internet, every industry has been turned upside down. Amazon changed retail. Uber changed transportation. YouTube changed video forever. With the invention of crypto, money is next. At the speed technology is growing, the future of money and securities are digital. Nine out of 10 millennials do not trust banks. The value of money relies on trust. Government debt is higher than it's ever been before. Central banks continue to print money. Fortunately, the world has a new solution. Experts predict in seven years, 10% of the world's economy will be in crypto-based assets. Today, 1 billion people have access to the financial industry. Crypto is about empowering the other 6 billion people by banking the unbanked. Do not underestimate this. Do you wish you invested in Google, Amazon, or Netflix before anyone ever knew about them? $1,000 invested in Netflix turned to over a half a million dollars. At Token Metrics, we help you find the next Netflix. Token Metrics users think differently about investing. They are early adopters looking for financial freedom. They are people who see a better world. A world without international borders. We believe in a world where everyone has access to the next financial revolution. At Token Metrics, we are creating a bridge that gets you to that revolution. We will help you make sound investments in this new world. The world's best investors do not rely on their intuition. They embrace technology and AI to invest. Token Metrics uses AI to find invisible patterns in data to help you invest and trade in crypto. In the past, we have used our data-driven system to achieve financial freedom. Now, we are giving you the keys. We created Token Metrics to be the only platform you'll ever need to make money in crypto. We give you AI and access to crypto experts at the best price. The moon is not the limit. To the moon and beyond. Disclaimer. Token Metrics Media LLC does not provide individually tailored investment advice and does not take a subscriber's or anyone's personal circumstance into consideration when discussing investments, nor is it registered as an investment advisor or broker dealer in any jurisdiction. Information contained herein is not an offer or solicitation to buy, hold, or sell any security. The Token Metrics team has advised and invested in many blockchain companies. A complete list of their advisory roles and current holdings can be viewed here at tokenmetrics.com slash disclosures. All right, all right. Hello, everybody. Happy Sunday. This is going to be quite a live stream. I mean, as we always say in crypto, there's never a dull moment in crypto, never a dull day, never a dull week. And it looks like the prophecy uh, is, is going to be fulfilled, Bill. <laughs> so it may and go away. <laughs> all right, all right. Bill and Forrest, how are you guys doing? Good. How about you? Great, great. Can't complain. I mean, everything's on discount. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today's going to be quite the live stream. Go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. Use the code 8576-2890. That's 8576-2890. Today's live stream is how to navigate a crypto market correction. BTC flash crash, Biden tax hike, which altcoins to watch. We're here to give you the best information in all of crypto. And as usual, we have our all-star team, Bill Noble and Forrest Pribish. Um, and be sure to follow us all across uh, our, our different platforms on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, the podcast, 
and we do have a few uh, admin things to kind of uh, get through here today. And be sure to check us out at tokenmetrics.com. We're basically a cryptocurrency investment research platform. We help crypto investors become smarter investors by leveraging data, analytics, and machine learning to become smarter investors. Okay, so on the agenda for today, so let's go through and do, let's see who was first on the live stream. So first person on the live stream was Javid Khan. What's up? Hey, uh, why does have any? Mrs. Adams, STX, Bitcoin 2020.1. Jan, what's up? Mindy, Amir, Dragon Ball Crypto, let's go. Michael Loretta, Ben Mendelson, Dave Jackson, Dinamo84. All right, lots of people on the stream. This is going across Twitter, uh, Facebook, YouTube. All right, be sure to smash the like button, subscribe, and to turn on alerts. So on the agenda today, uh, first of all, first thing I'd like to cover is we are hiring. So do you want to join the all-star team? Right. Uh, Forrest joined us this year. Um, Bill joined us a couple years back, <laughs> but uh, the team has been expanding. So if you want to join Token Metrics and work with us and join the vision of helping bring economic empowerment to all of mankind and humanity and go to the moon and beyond with all of us together, go to tokenmetrics.com slash careers. We're hiring for lots of di different roles. So if you're an all-star, join the all-star team. Then to all our family in Texas, and anybody who wants to join us this Thursday, we're hosting Austin Crypto Night. So me, Bill, will be hosting in person uh, for about three hours, a nice, intimate get together, a gathering uh, for anybody who wants to join the crypto family. Right. So we'll be, it's basically networking, food, drinks, live music uh, with Bill, myself here in Austin, Texas on Thursday, 6 p.m. Just go to tmt.link slash kryptonite to sign up uh if you've ever wanted to meet me or bill in person well here's your opportunity right it'll be a nice small intimate gathering uh we have a private venue just just for all of us this would um so if you want to meet us in person be sure to join that i know bill has been requested to attend a meetup uh so this will be his first one so come through come strong uh bill is very 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 excited for that right bill yes sir <laughs> All right, um, then let's see what else we wanted. Okay, so without further ado, let's hop straight into the market update. Okay, uh, let me take it away, Bill. Okay, good evening, everybody. This is the market update. Well, it seems legacy investors have been welcomed to crypto by Coinbase. Believe it or not, there are a lot of legacy investors who have watched Bitcoin go from 3,000 to 64,000 and held off because, oh wait, I can just buy the Coinbase IPO to get involved. So I don't have to buy crypto, I'll just wait for that. Okay, excellent. Coinbase IPO comes out at 400 something. Coinbase proceeds to immediately trade down to 300. Enhancing the welcome to crypto experience, Coinbase happens to IPO at the local high in Bitcoin. So if you bought the IPO in the stock market, you not only bought the high in the Coinbase stock, but the crypto market also turned around and crashed in your face. Again, sorry to say it, but welcome to crypto. As Bitcoin continues to fall through 49K, we would estimate that the minimum target is 42K for a 35% correction. Now, I would like to also welcome everybody aboard the Vomit Comet. Total crypto derivatives liquidations, in other words, professional leveraged buyers are getting absolutely wiped out. Okay, this was before they announced the tax plan. Okay, after the tax plan, there was a second green bar of liquidations hinting that leveraged buyers of Bitcoin continue to get washed out. So as you're watching this, if you're wondering why Bitcoin is down 5%, if you're watching it later and you're wondering why it went to say 43K 
or flash crashed even lower than that potentially, this is why people buying using derivatives or with borrowed money are getting hurt and washed out. Now, as a result, the fear index is rising, mainly because I think local crypto players don't really understand the magnitude of what is happening. Yes, it is cool that Bitcoin and crypto have gone mainstream, but this is the first time I think that we're seeing like a gigantic institutional margin call come out of nowhere, right? It's classic. Smart money, Coinbase sells the top in every way, and then all the margin levered players get wiped out. Twitter, let's talk about it. Rumor has it big influencers on Twitter are getting their accounts completely liquidated because of this margin situation. The result is people tracking FUD on Twitter are showing record levels of distress in crypt the cryptoverse on Twitter. Normally, this is an indication of a bottom, and it may wind up a bottom in a couple of days. In the meantime, how much damage can be done? Let's discuss that. First, a word from our artificial intelligence. This is the Uniswap annual crypto portfolio developed a while ago. Notice in the top right that the our artificial intelligence allocated 30% for the year to stable coins. Not investment advice, but just let you know, our artificial intelligence is telling you 30% in stable coins. And I'll leave it at that. Another reminder, CoinGecko, market cap listing. Binance number three, Cardano number six. Dogecoin ahead of Polkadot at number seven. Now, one brief reminder about altcoins is that altcoins rely on continued inflows of money, okay, in order to hold up these gigantic market caps because there are always long selling and always shorts pressing. So there has to be new money flowing in every day which poses a question. If everybody has borrowed money to buy Bitcoin and everyone is selling, who exactly is, what money or who is buying all these altcoins for the next week or so? In other words, how does the money flow in when the money is flowing out? Something to consider for the week ahead. Now, some rocket science, margin debt, in the stock market has reached 10% of global GDP. I'm sorry, national GDP. That means people have borrowed trillions of dollars against stocks. And you might ask, what have they done with it? Well, they've bought more stocks, which is why stocks continue to go up. Here we have NASDAQ 100, uh, as you can see, at very lofty levels, but at resistance, all right? And then the most important thing to remember, headed into next week, okay? So I've told you that, you know, people are selling because people with borrowed money are getting liquidated in crypto. The good news, that eventually ends. The bad news is we have evidence showing people are borrowing money in the stock market and using it to buy Bitcoin, okay? So I know this graph's complicated, but I just gave it to you simply. This comes from one of our premier analysts. Please be careful out there. There is a lot of borrowed money chasing Bitcoin, and there is a lot of borrowed money chasing hot altcoins. There is potential here for a kind of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday wipeout in crypto. Okay, it's been a while since I think capital markets have seen an across the board, oh my God, and we may be headed for that. Again, 72 hours doesn't sound like a lot, but it is if it's a system wide margin call. So in Crippleville, friends, be careful, 
Keep your trade sizes small. Don't invest if you don't have to. Doing nothing and waiting is an option. And that, friends, is the market update. All right, all right. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill, some people are saying uh, there's an issue with your mic. Uh, could you maybe turn down the gain and just maybe uh, move, move it slightly away? Not sure if that will fix it, but hopefully it does. All right. Is that better? Um, I guess, audience, do you guys think that's better? Yeah. Okay, people are saying they don't think it's the mic, it's the internet. Um, okay, we'll check into that. Apologies. Okay. So if you enjoyed that market update, be sure to smash the like button, subscribe, and turn on alerts. So let's now shift over to Forrest, who will go through the, the, uh, sorry, the anatomy of a market correction. Forrest, take yeah, it away. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to try to break down and provide some uh, a, a backdrop for this correction. And keep in mind, I'm analyzing this correction through the lens of looking predominantly at Bitcoin and crypto charts. Now, obviously, uh, if there's issues in the stock market or in the legacy market, uh, there's um, outside FUD, whether that's uh, China, you know, the China blackout causing a, a, a drop in Bitcoin's hash rate and subsequently causing a crash, or if it's related to the the potential tax hikes. Uh, I'm, I'm cutting all of that out and looking at predominantly historical Bitcoin movements and corrections right? for, the, for this analysis. Now, if we look at this uh, bull market cycle in 2016 and 2017, or rather mainly 2017, uh, we can see a series uh, of corrections throughout the entire bull market. Uh, first correction was 34%, second was 34%, then a 33%. Now, there's something really interesting about these 34 and 33% corrections that we'll get to later. Then we had a 39% correction, followed by a 40% correction, followed by another 30% correction. So these corrections are quite common, uh, even in a bull market. And it wasn't until uh, the final peak where we saw over a 40% correction, we saw a 43% correction when Bitcoin peaked. Now, if we look at where we're at currently, and since I took this screenshot, I think we did make a new low. It was a couple hundred dollars lower maybe than what our previous one, uh, but we're going to call it 27% correction. So far this market cycle, we've had about three corrections over 20 to 21%, and that's been the 31% correction from $42,000 down to about 28500 we had this 26% correction uh, that resolved itself quite quickly, and we're in the midst of about a 27% correction. So this isn't out of the norm for what we've seen in the past with Bitcoin, and it's definitely not out of the norm uh, for what we can see Bitcoin bounce back from. And in, in fact, this is a logarithmic chart that you're looking at right now for, for Bitcoin in 2017 and 2018. So this last move up after the 30% correction down to around... Uh, no, sorry, this, this last 40% correction took us down to about 3, 000, under $3,000 uh, and Bitcoin then rallied to 19,700 after a 40% correction down to $3,000. Uh, so Bitcoin can can absolutely bounce back after a nasty correction. It's, it's not out of the realm of possib possibility. In fact, uh, historically, it's quite likely that we bounce back in a bull market. Uh, now, we've got Bitcoin's price here from 2012 to present. And what I want to uh, draw your attention to is the, the market tops, the market peaks, and what they look like in comparison to where we're at right now. Uh, if you notice the pattern here, these peaks are very sharp and sudden, and Bitcoin never follows through and retests that level. Every time Bitcoin's ever followed back up and retested a level, it has eventually broken through it. And I've actually highlighted these regions here in green. And you can see the market tops are very volatile. It goes up and pokes the top, comes back down, and doesn't retest it. Uh, we've been at a point where Bitcoin has tested and retested and retested $60,000. $60,000 has been a brutally difficult uh, line of resistance for Bitcoin to get through. But historically, when we test and retest over and over again, we eventually get through. And I know we did get up to almost $65,000, but we fell right back down. Uh, when, when Bitcoin does this, historically, 
based on previous market cycles. Now, of course, history repeats itself until it doesn't, right? Just because this is the pattern we've seen in the past doesn't mean that it has to repeat itself. Uh, but if we want to look at the at, at history uh, to try to make draw draw rational conclusions for the future, this doesn't look from a chart uh, pattern perspective like a, a traditional Bitcoin top of the market. I also wanna draw your attention really quickly to altcoin dominance. Altcoin dominance just hit a really key level of resistance at 50% uh, that I think could be uh, causing uh, uh, kind of overlapping with this peak that we saw in Bitcoin, uh, where altcoin dominance uh, has gotten a little bit overextended and might actually need to come back down for a correction. It's shot right up from 50%, uh, really without, or four, to 50% without really even stopping. So altcoins uh, do seem like they need to uh, to cool off a little bit. And speaking of altcoin market cap, we see that we have had a little bit of a correction. So this is all the cryptocurrency uh, value in altcoins. So this is the total cryptocurrency market cap minus Bitcoin. And what I wanna draw your attention to is the overvaluation against this trend line that the altcoin market cap has seen. So this linear trend line on a logarithmic scale means that the altcoin market cap space or the altcoin crypto space has been growing at an exponential rate with occasional parabolic bubbles off of this trend line. Our first bubble was 2,400% overvalued, followed by a 7,700% altcoin season. We're currently at a 330 Two percent overvaluation against this trend line. Now, obviously, we would expect uh, decreasing volatility as the market matures, right? So, I don't think we're in for a seventy-seven hundred percent overvaluation. In fact, we might not even get to a twenty-four hundred percent overvaluation. I think that would be you know way too high. But we are only at a three hundred and thirty-two percent overvaluation against this trend line. And I do think that is low compared to what we could get to. So just uh, more evidence that we might not be at the top yet, or we may not have peaked. Same thing goes for total crypto market cap. We are currently about 350% overvalued against this uh, trend line that we've seen. Now we have been on a trend line of six green months in a row, six green months where the total cryptocurrency space has been growing and growing very rapidly at a parabolic pace. Getting a red candle or a red month isn't that big of a deal uh, historically in, in bull markets. If we look back at this, this 2017 run up to where we were overvalued 2,600% against this trend line, we had quite, if we draw this white trend line uh, and we can zoom in here, we had periods of time where we were overvalued against it and undervalued. We oscillated up and down uh, above it and below it. So maybe we do go below it uh, and hopefully the bull market can continue on to our targets of uh, maybe three, five or $10 trillion. Now, so that's the backdrop uh, for this analysis. And that's to say is if you're gonna ask me personally, based off of historical Bitcoin data, uh, cutting out all of the, the China uh, blackout FUD and the tax FUD and cutting out, you know, looking at the legacy market. If we're just looking at Bitcoin, it doesn't feel like a traditional Bitcoin top yet, right? So recently, Bitcoin has seen this stark correction. It's been about 2,700%. We've actually dipped a little bit lower since I took this screenshot, but you can see there's very, very strong buying pressure at 47,777, which as we've wicked below it, the buying pressure has come back in. Now, these are what I refer to as margin buying pressure levels. Uh, I'm not going to get into exactly how to calculate them in this video, but what they signify is the level at which long leverage traders can start buying and have their liquidation point below a key uh, support level. In this case, 43,000. So as Bitcoin drops below 47,777, people can go long on 10x margin and get their leverage or their, their liquidation point under 43,000, which is a very key support level. 10x is 10 times the normal buying pressure as usual. 
Now, what's also interesting is we have our 4X short level that held as support as well at 48,640, right? We ended up bouncing off it and breaking through below, but this is the point at which shorts can no longer have their liquidation point above the all-time high at 64,854, I think was the all-time high. Now, all that to say, if we fall through the next two levels, are our $43,000 base level, and then our 3X short level, uh, where if Bitcoin drops below 43,236, the 3X shorts cannot have their liquidation point safely above six, the, the all-time high. Now, further support at $43,000 is both this trend line, this white trend line, uh, is the trend line we were at before the pandemic. And then you saw the pandemic crash happened, and I would postulate that all of this price action in 2020, for the most part, was undervalued against the trend line that we would have been on in a bull market, in the bull market, uh, had the pandemic not hit and suppressed the price and caused this crash. So eventually, we did get back on track. As we hit $42,000, Bitcoin got back on track on this, this trend line, uh, has since uh, extended above this trend line, but a correction would to $43,000 would bring it back down to touching this trend line. Now, uh, consequent or, or uh, coincidentally, 43,000 or thereabouts, 43,413 is also the 20 week moving average. Historically, the 20 week moving average is a uh, massive bull market support. Uh, when, when Bitcoin comes back down to touch the 20 week moving average, uh, you want to cross your fingers, hope and pray that it holds and gets a bounce off of it. Historically, it does, uh, it does do that in bull markets quite often, quite frequently. But when we break below the 20 week moving average, historically, it's not a good thing. Uh, however, historically, it has been very strong support. Now, a, a correction down to $43,000 would also be a 34% correction, as I mentioned, was a very popular correction point uh, in previous bull market cycles. Why 34%? Because that is where the 3x shorts run out of selling pressure. You can no longer go 3x short once you cross over 33.33% of a correction. That's why 34% historically, if we go back to the very beginning, these 33, 34% corrections are so common. Now, occasionally we go below that, a uh, deeper correction, but 33 and 34% corrections in Bitcoin are quite common. Uh, and that's the anatomy of this market correction for Bitcoin. All right. Uh, thank you, Forrest. That was great. So if you enjoyed that analysis, uh, be sure to smash the like button, subscribe, and join us at Token Metrics. Okay. All right. Let's segue to the next segment. So go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. Use the code 85762890. All right. So time for question of the day. Have we reached the top of the Bitcoin uh, in this market cycle? The options are, I'm afraid so. No. Time to basically buy more. Third option, not sure. So I know we kind of touched on the, on whether this is the top uh, but let's maybe go delve deeper into that. Bill, uh, what answer do you have for this? Okay, well, I'm going to go that this is a clear opportunity. Uh, when you have leveraged players being liquidated, it's, it's scary. It doesn't last long. And you have to be willing to step in while selling has stopped. So my answer is it's an opportunity. You just have to play it carefully. All right. And then Forrest, maybe kind of do a recap again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I think 43K would be a big buying opportunity. If, if we do sell down to $43,000, I'll personally, again, not financial advice, I will personally be buying $43,000, right? whether it's uh, in Bitcoin or altcoins. Um, it just doesn't feel historically within the silo of looking at Bitcoin. It doesn't feel like a top. Now, 
there's obviously bigger things going on in the market, right? We saw the pandemic come in last year and absolutely crush the price of, of Bitcoin as, along with everything else. So these, these other externalities can absolutely affect the market, uh, whether it's the, the Joe Biden tax capital gains tax bill or it's, uh, you know, China blacking out the, the hashing rate, the, you know, the blacking out the grid, right? These other things can definitely cause uh, Bitcoin in the market to crash, but within the bubble in the silo of Bitcoin, it doesn't feel like a top, and that's why I'll be buying forty three thousand if if we head down there. All right. So one thing I'd like to bring up here is the Visual Trends indicator for Bitcoin. So this is what we have on the site. So both both indicators, both the high frequency and the low frequency, did turn bearish on Bitcoin. So I think this is very very interesting. In a way, it kind of aligns with what Forrest and Bill have been saying earlier in the show. Um, now, I don't think this is the, the top in, in the sense that I don't think we're going to enter a bear market. However, as mentioned, I think we're basically going through a correction, right? Because for both the high frequency indicator and the low frequency indicator to turn bearish, because it's been bullish since basically 11K, right? So I think the prophecy might be fulfilled. <laughs> and I think in May, we have to be very, very cautious, right? So, uh, oh, to our customers this week, Bill mentioned that when we say sell in May and go away, we weren't saying to just go on vacation, but I think uh, maybe Bill kind of add to this. I think you mentioned that in terms of any highly speculative coins, basically if you're holding Dogecoin and, and any meme coins, basically any coins you don't think have actual value in May, you probably might want to get out of that. Bill, could you maybe kind of cover that? Sure. So. There's a couple things to keep in mind. First, you want to make sure that when things get volatile, that you believe in what you own and that you own it for good reason. So for example, if you listen to Forrest explain, you know, the support levels in Bitcoin and the decisions he's going to make, he's very clear as to what he wants to own and why. I would encourage you to emulate what you're hearing from my colleague. For example, do you know why you would be long Dogecoin, Cardano, or Polkadot? Polkadot has staking. Okay, that's one example. But if the boat rocks for a day or a week, you don't want to ruin your whole year. One of the things behind sell in May and go away Really what it means is just protect the money you've made during the year, rest if you can, and look for a better opportunity to get long. So we're in a TV business and we like to be catchy, but really that phrase means, you know, take profits in, you know, mirror trades like Dogecoin. Be careful about catching the falling knife and stuff you know deep in your heart is no good. And buy quality when you can at a discounted price, like Warren Buffett would. Well said, Bill. Well said. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe we could even rephrase it in terms of May. When May comes, you want to be in quality, not quantity. Right? So if you've been chasing pump and dumps, uh, maybe those polka dot ideas, right? Uh, in May, you want to make sure... If the music stops, whatever you're holding is something that won't leave you wrecked. So let's see what the audience has said. Okay, so the, the audience has voted. No, it's a buying opportunity. I like that. I like that. Lots of uh, fundamental investors uh, want to buy the dip. Okay, let's go on to the next segment. Thought of the week. How would a possible Biden capital gains tax hike affect crypto. So for those who maybe haven't heard the news, Joe Biden is, is proposing raising capital gains tax, I believe to 43%. Basically, he, he wants to double the capital gains tax. Um, and that basically had the whole market essentially dump uh, in the last week or so. So the options are, do you think this will have a negative effect? Uh, other option, not really any effect. Third option, uh, I don't think this will get passed at all. So Forrest, uh, what's your take on the capital gains tax Biden plans to propose? You know, I'm not uh, not a, a 
political expert by any means, uh, but to me, uh, and, and take my opinion here with a grain of salt, I'm not an expert by any means. It seems like um, kind of maybe, I don't know what the right word for it is, fronting a little bit, maybe um, trying to put forth the effort of getting a bill that would tax the rich through. Um, but I'm not sure that it's actually going to pass. If it did pass, obviously, I think that would be bad news. Um, but I can't imagine a lot of wealthy people with the resources uh, to to skirt tax laws uh, legally, right? They can, you know, have an offshore business, offshore bank accounts, become a citizen of the Cayman Islands or Puerto Rico. They, they can go to different countries. Put it this way, if... Um, if the tax, the capital gains tax increased, uh, and I don't, I'm not, I don't have the, the, I'm not the wealthiest person in the world, nor do I have the, the resources to do so, but I would absolutely be making it a point um, to see what I could do to not pay 43% capital gains taxes, whether, whether that's registering a houseboat in Puerto Rico and living there for 180 days out of the year, or w whatever I had to do to not pay 43, 44% taxes, even if it meant having to move somewhere else for six months out of the year, I think myself and a lot of other people would do that because 43 to 44% capital gains taxes is just crazy. Uh, that's that's very, very high. It makes it to, to where it's almost not worth taking on the extra risk of, of investing in a lot of things because you have to, you're giving away 40 plus percent of your gains. Uh, so again, take my opinion here with a grain of salt. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll even pass. All right. Thank you, Forrest. Bill, what's your take on it? Okay, so I I would call this tape risk, right? In other words, the people who put this proposal forth uh, uh, aren't just going to give up on it one day just because most people in the economics and markets world, you know, don't think it makes much sense, right? These people are going to promote their proposals on the tape and Bitcoin is the millionaire's cryptocurrencies, right? You can Google it anywhere. You know, the majority of Bitcoin is held by a small number of millionaire whales. Okay. So noise about the proposal. Note I said noise or talk on the news or talk on the tape, as they say in legacy, can probably move markets. It's on, up and down in an unexpected fashion. In other words, one minute it'll pass, the next minute it won't. One senator will say, I'm serious about this going through. An economist will say, it's ridiculous. I would anticipate we're looking at at least a week of back and forth on the tape. And don't forget, it has to go to the floor of the legislature where people will again be talking about yes or no. I would imagine this has a bigger effect on Bitcoin. No, I do not think it wrecks the entire market. I think the market's going to adjust to this, the crypto market, in a week. Okay. But noise about this is more of a risk than the proposal itself. All right. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. I mean, I think this is honestly crazy, <laughs> in my opinion, because we're basically just getting out of the pandemic and they want to now add capital gains tax, right? I mean, if anything, I'm glad I moved to Texas because <laughs> now there's no state income tax here. But I think even though the proposal is meant to affect only millionaires, if you're in crypto, you, you have to have aspirations of becoming a millionaire, right? So do you want to pay almost half of your taxes to the government? Right. Because to me, that's basically not really creating incentives, right, for people to want to build wealth, because essentially they're printing money, yet they're trying to tax us almost half of our inc half of our capital gains. Right. And I think this will probably create a whole new, maybe even industry for ways to not have to pay taxes. Right. Because I know some people who invest in crypto through their Roth IRA, I believe. Right. Uh, and that's one way to invest in crypto without having to pay taxes. And I think you basically only pay taxes either at the end or beginning. I'm not, I'm not sure, but basically, I think once you're like 59, you can withdraw funds basically tax-free, right? Um, but I mean, I've been looking into several options to n try to mitigate, or I would say 
have a lower tax footprint. Um, <laughs> some options I've been looking into include actually insurance. Uh, I've heard lots of wealthy people invest uh, through insurance policies. I'm not sure if there's any for crypto, but anyway, uh, I think pl products like liquidity, which I'm very, very bullish on, where people can basically borrow against a crypto without having to sell will become even more popular, right? Whether liquidity, whether uh, Celsius, whether Nexo, I think people now as they're build, building wealth in crypto will try to not have to pay taxes. Uh, and I don't think this is really a long-term way to get people to boost the economy. But anyway, let's see what people have to say. So the winner is, oh, it's a tie. So it will not have much impact on crypto in the long term. Second option, I don't think this is, this proposal is going to get passed. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I hope it does not get passed at all. <laughs> okay, so thank you for voting. Let's now move on to the next segment. One of our favorite segments, it's time for Crypto Showdown. So time for the top altcoin picks for May. May is about a week away, but we want to go through and basically sh showcase with you three projects we've been keeping tabs on. So the options are Cardano, ADA, Solana, and Third Chain, Rune. So out of these three coins, we'll go through and tell you, in our opinions, what we think we'll do best in May. But also go to minty.com, use the code 8576 and tell us what you think has the best upside in May. So Bill, um, in your opinion, what do you think will have the best month in May? Okay, well, if you hear me out there, the answer is pretty simple. Um, I, I think it's Solana. Uh, these guys are serious. We've had internal talks about this. Uh, they bought, they bought the company is the Ren token. Okay. I'm going to try to pull up a chart here, but a lot of people, there's a lot of talk about an Ethereum replacement seems to be the 2021 talk of the year, okay? And everybody has talked about everything but Solana. Let's say the market keeps going this, meaning, you know, we have like a two to three day dip in Bitcoin. There's kind of a margin call or it ends soon. I don't see any reason why Solana can't go to 70. Okay, or higher. Breakouts like Cardano and Polkadot have been absolute freight trains once they got started. And it looks like Solana is about to do exactly the same thing. So once the decline in the Bitcoins end, once the margin calls are done, the bid may switch into ETH and Solana and I would not be shocked if that was the two horse race. All right. Thank you, Bill. Uh, first, how about you? What do you think has the most upside uh, in May? I agree with, I agree with Bill. Um, Solana, everything I've re been reading about it, uh, it's potentially providing the same niche value as Binance Smart Chain, but it's more decentralized. So you've got Solana kind of stuck in the middle of Binance Smart Chain and Ethereum in the sense that uh, from what I've been reading, Solana is not as decentralized as Ethereum because the cost to run a Solana node is rather expensive, uh, which means that only you know certain people can have ha have the access to capital to start a Solana node, which reduces how decentralized Solana really is. Then on the other end, you've got Binance Smart Chain, uh, which is really not decentralized at all. Um, you know, it's pretty much run by by Binance. Uh, so the the reason Binance Smart Chain blew up or BNB token blew up was because it was able to saw a lot of, of development on chain, right? A lot of decentralized applications were built on Binance Smart Chain, um, but then it had way lower gas fees. So now we've got a third contender coming in, Solana, that has ultra, ultra low gas fees. Um, and it's also starting to explode with development. I believe there's already six or seven decentralized applications with tokens that are trading on Solana. And I keep seeing more and more projects, uh, Solana projects pop up. So while I personally feel like I've missed the boat on Solana, I don't own any Solana and I don't particularly want to buy any at, at its all time high at $50. 
That being said, I wouldn't be surprised if it becomes a, it's a number 13 or 14 coin right now. I wouldn't be surprised if it, it breaks into the top seven or eight or maybe even the top five based on the development that I'm seeing on it. My personal re, uh, the, my personal plan for getting involved in Solana is I'm going to buy a couple Solana and start providing some liquidity on these different decentralized applications, participating in hope for later on down the road, potentially getting some airdrops. Uh, that's my plan for getting involved in the ecosystem. Uh, but as far as May goes, I mean, Solana has been crushing it so far. I think it's uh, like Bill said, they mean business. All right. Thank you, Forrest. So I would like to go through and see what the visual trends indicators say. So if we go to Solana, the high frequency, I think we have to use high frequency because we're basically looking at just May, right? And for those who are new, high frequency versus low frequency just means the uh, how, how, how much it trades, right? High frequency is able to react a lot quicker to movements in the market and basically it trades a lot more low frequency trades a lot less so it typically has a lag that's better so that's better for hodlers so solana is still bullish so if we go back it's been bullish since a dollar eight and right now it's at almost 50 bucks right so that's what a 25x so the trends indicator has done a great job with that if we go to cardano ada the high frequency indicator turned bearish on cardano basically at a dollar 15 it's been bullish since 10 cents so it's basically saying in may it's not too optimistic uh, if we go to thor chain this is still bullish this turned bullish at 592 so pretty much just looking at this i would have to pick solana or thor chain now one thing i would like to share if you go to defi llama this is a dashboard kind of like defi pulse but a lot better because they look at all all chains, right? So if we go here and just look at Solana in the last, let's, let's actually do the last one month, right? So total value locked has gone from 135 million all the way to almost a billion. So I think in terms of narratives, there's lots of interest and lots of movement going to that blockchain. So I think if we're trying to go into May, I think they definitely do have lots of momentum going into May. So I'd likely pick that, that as well. Even though it's already been up, I think there's still lots of upside. Okay, so let's see what the audience has voted. Okay, uh, just give me one second here, having some <laughs> technical difficulties. All right, so the winner is Cardano. Wow, <laughs> lots of uh, Cardano fans here. <laughs> what do you guys think, Bill and Forrest? I like Cardano. I, I like Cardano. I I just uh, I think we're waiting for Cardano native assets to be uh, developed, and I'm not, I'm not familiar enough with Cardano's roadmap to to speak on that. Uh, I don't know exactly when that'll be, but I I don't think it's in May. I could be wrong. Um, I'll double check on that. All right, Bill. What do you think about the winner? Well, people have made money in Cardano, right? I mean, when something goes from ten cents to a dollar fifty. Um, you're not going to shake somebody's belief in it with great statistics from another <laughs> blockchain, right? I mean, they've made bank. Uh, from an from an analytical point of view, uh, it's time to take your money. But you know, if you're like sitting over here and there's a giant pile of money and it's in a big box that's Cardano, it's tough not to like it. So I understand where people are coming from. All right. So people are saying there's some news coming up in. Uh, on the 29th of May for Cardano, it seems like. Okay, definitely going to have to look, look into that. All right, so let's now segue to the next segment. Once again, thank you for voting. If you're enjoying this live stream, be sure to smash the like button, subscribe, put on alerts, share this video with a friend, crypto family, tell a friend to tell a friend. Okay, somebody's saying there's African news coming. Okay, it looks like Cardano is going into Africa. Interesting. Okay, yeah, so tell a friend to tell a friend that crypto is the future of money and that we're live streaming. Okay, so we're going to skip crypto therapy for today. Okay, so here's a good question from the forum. Uh, be sure to go to forum.tokenmetrics.com to post any questions, and our team will go through there and try, try to answer each question on the live stream. Uh, this is kind of a lo long question, but basically the Cliff Notes version is how to make passive income in the crypto space. So this person, uh, PMAC, is asking uh, what we like in terms of making passive income in the space. Very good question, uh, especially as we're heading into a correction. Uh, Forrest, what 
methods do you, do you like in terms of making passive income in crypto? Staking and yield farming for me personally, uh, I have identified a portion of my portfolio that uh, it's about 20% of my portfolio that I do plan on holding into the into the bull market if I can time and exit appropriately. And most of those coins that I'll be holding are, are uh, coins that I can earn a yield on in some form or another. Uh, Polkadot being a big one. So with Polkadot, you can stake for 12%, but you also have parachain auctions coming up hopefully very soon. Uh, it's very, very close on the roadmap for both Kusama and Polkadot. And you'll be able to crowd loan out your Polkadot to earn tokens from, from uh, projects that are bidding on parachains. Uh, so that's a big one. Uh, crowd loaning for Polkadot and Kusama, I think will be a good passive income method. Um, like I said, staking yield farming. Uh, there's plenty of protocols that are offering, especially on stable coins, even in a bear market. Um, we're seeing uh, APYs on, on DAI and USDT 10% uh, plus, which I mean, that's better than the S&P 500, uh, you know, annual annual return on average for the, like the last 30 or 40 years. I think the S&P 500 returns eight or 9% historically. Could be wrong on that. Maybe it's 7%, but if you can get 10 to, to 15% on your stable coins, just, just yield farming or providing liquidity somewhere, uh, that's, that's amazing. And then if you also add, add it to an exchange where you're also potentially yield farming other tokens, whether they're uh, Uniswap or SushiSwap tokens, uh, whatever, whatever platform that is, there's a lot of protocols that offer yield farming incentives. Uh, so I would definitely recommend, not financial advice, but I definitely recommend getting uh, involved in, in DeFi. Uh, DeFi is the, the key to unlocking yield. All right. Thank you, Forrest. Uh, Bill, how about you? What options do you like in terms of passive income in, in crypto? All right. Well, the, the obvious one, which I'll let you go into is helium, right? That's basically like plug it in and go. I also think there's a learning curve in earning yield, right? You need to keep with reputable players. I would actually start with BlockFi and Celsius. Just learn how to make a deposit uh, and get, say, anywhere from 6 to 10%, depending on whether it's a big crypto like ETH or Litecoin or a stable coin that they're paying you know, 10% plus on. I think if you can do staking on an exchange, particularly in a world where there's a lot of market volatility, that that's perhaps a good idea. But, you know, when the earth is shaking, even if it's for a day, uh, I would go with helium, but I'll let you talk to that. All right, thank you, Bill. Yeah, I mean, um, I think this is definitely something everybody should have in their portfolio as ways to just make passive income because this helps you hodl good projects. And I think any project worth hodling long-term you want to have ways of earning passive income, whether it's through staking, whether it's through yield farming. So I'll share what I'm currently doing. Uh, so a project we covered and shared with the customers recently is called Liquidity. Uh, basically, long, long story short, it's basically a more capital efficient way to borrow and lend money, right? Or, or, but basically borrow money. Uh, it competes with MakerDAO, but from a code perspective, we think this is solid, right? <clears throat> it scored over 80% on the code review uh, about a few weeks back. And I myself ended up investing. Uh, I went in, put in about 1% of my portfolio <clears throat> and then have scaled up into about 5% of my por portfolio. Uh, basically, I, I went in, put in 1%, began staking this. Uh, basically, you can stake your tokens. And I made $2,500 in one week. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> All right. Um, so after that, I basically bought more. <laughs> um, but here, I'll go through and kind of share why I like this project. All right. It's because we, we shared this with our customers, with our professional customers on the Wednesday private call that we think one of the next big narratives in crypto are capital efficient protocols, meaning that protocols that do more with less money. Because in crypto, when it comes to borrowing money, most protocols force you to, what it, I, I won't say they force you, but they basically, you basically have to spend a lot more, more money as collateral to borrow money. And now liquidity lets you basically 
only use only put up to 110 percent of your collateral to borrow money and it's interest free right so if you go to the site here uh i highly recommend checking out this project we covered this when it was about five million dollar market cap now it's at 81 million dollar market cap although the fully diluted valuation is pretty high and lots of tokens have been entering the supply but to me i think this is a great long-term hold uh, and when i plan to cash out on crypto i'll likely use this protocol right because especially if joe Biden is trying to increase capital gains taxes um i think it'll make a lot more sense to just borrow my crypto and using this platform with interest-free rates all right so basically the only money you pay is the 0.5 percent i believe entry and exit fee but you, you can basically borrow money for no interest rate which is pretty crazy right uh but if you go to their site so they have what they call front ends, meaning that lots of different dashboards done by different providers. So the one I've been using is Liquidify because you basically aren't paying any fees right now. Uh, all the others, for the most part, the front end is basically taking a commission on on whatever you're making. So if you go to to liquid to ETH dot liquidity dot slash stake, you can see right here the the APR is eight hundred sixty three percent. Right, that's a lot of money, uh, and this is a cash flow positive token. What does that mean? So anybody who stakes, you basically are earning a share of all the fees that they earn or the protocol earns from anybody who borrows on the protocol. Right. So this becomes a value because if we go back here, even though this protocol just launched recently, if we go to DeFi Llama, Liquidity is now thirteenth in terms of total value locked in all of crypto, right? They have two point, almost $3 billion locked up and basically a, a month or less, right? So if we go to just Ethereum protocols, they're already in the top 10, right? There's more money on liquidity now than on synthetics, than Balancer, than Bancor, even Vesper, right? So to me, I think this project is here to stay. And if you're trying to make passive income, I think, at least for me, it's probably the project I'm most excited about. Then obviously we also have uh, Helium as well. Okay, with that being said, uh, hopefully that was helpful. Uh, let's now move on to the next topic. Okay, so go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, user code 85762890. Okay, first question, I'm all in crypto. While I have taken out my initial investment out, I had a, so let me just try to go through this question real quick. So basically, let me, let me rephrase this. He's all in in crypto. He took out his initial investment. Uh, and basically before the correction, what would we do? And I think we kind of covered this, but let's say you're bill, let's say somebody is all in on crypto and this correction is coming. What would you do? Well, the first thing I would do is make sure that you don't just hold more than you don't have 20 or 30% or more in any one coin, right? Like diversification is key. Um, don't have everything in Cardano. Don't have everything in Bitcoin. Don't even have everything in Ethereum. So be well balanced. Um, the second thing is if there's a correction or a correction is in play, I think you should always have 5% sitting around just in case there's kind of a flash event or who knows, maybe it's a reverse, maybe it's a melt up in Solana. I, I don't know. You just always want to have something in case you need to make a fast move. Don't be all in. You know, always have some cash. All right. Thank you, Bill. Forrest, how about you? Yeah. So obviously can't give personal financial advice, but it, you said you took out your initial investment. That's uh, great news because now you're just free rolling. Um, now, if it were me, uh, obviously we're in the middle of a correction, but if it were me uh, and, you know, I have a higher risk profile uh, because I have a very long term time frame with, with crypto, I'm, I'm relatively young i'm under 30 years old so taking out my initial investment i'd be looking and that that tells me you have cash on hand 
I'd probably, as long as as long as you have taxes covered, right? If you've had if you've got enough money, so where you're not going to have to go negative on an investment, you know, if, if in tax season here in the next month or two, um, I'd be looking to potentially buy a dip down at forty three thousand dollars. Now, again, could we go lower than forty three thousand dollars? Could this have been the top? Absolutely. Could we have uh, externalities that drive you know completely crash the market? Absolutely, but. For me, I have a higher risk profile. I think 43,000 would be a, a big buying opportunity. I think 48, 47, 46,000 where we're currently at is a big buying opportunity. Um, so honestly, I'd be looking to get long, but if you don't have as, as high of a risk profile as me, I would say free, you're free rolling. You're free rolling. You've, you've protected your initial investment. There's nothing wrong with just waiting out a correction and and seeing where we go from here. Uh, as Bill said, doing nothing is an option. And right now, with everything going on and as crazy as, as everything is, it's probably a really good option. All right. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, first of all, congrats on taking out your initial investment, right? Because that means you basically, everything is house money. So, if anything, I think you can be more patient as first just mentioned, you can also just wait it out, wait it out, find the right next move, right? Because I feel like people have a tendency to over trade and FOMO into something and then they get wrecked, right? So I think what you're doing is fine. Uh, if you're all in on crypto, I think that's fine because right now we're basically in a bull run. So it makes sense. However, once we enter a real bear market, you want to really get into other assets, right? Meaning that you don't want to be all in on crypto. And I love crypto, but it makes sense to be all in during a bull run. But I mean, as we saw, right, when Bitcoin went from 20K to 3K in uh, a few years back, crypto was on a hiatus pretty much, right? So it makes sense to be in crypto when it's going up, but when it's crashing, you want to make sure you have other assets, uh, assets whether it's real estate, stocks, whatever, right? Just have multiple streams of income. Uh, and I think for this, for the future bear market, as we mentioned earlier, I think having passive ways of earning even crypto is a way to really uh, hedge yourself in crypto, right? So whether it's liquidity, whether it's staking, whether it's lending, uh, but I think right now just basically just kind of hang in there and be patient. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Thoughts on Hedera Hashgraph? HBAR, uh, which is a competitor to VeChain in the West. Uh, yes, uh, Bill, maybe could you do TA on Hedera Hashgraph? All right. Um, so as Bill's pulling that up, uh, I also have it here on token metrics. So the low frequency indicator uh, turned bearish on this. So turned bearish on at around 26 cents. It's been bullish since about 3.8 cents. The high frequency uh, indicator is also bearish. Um, so let's see if the TA also matches up with that. But uh, looks like it hasn't really had the best few months. It's kind of basically been going sideways. Uh, Bill, let me know whenever you're ready. Okay, coming up. Okay. <clears throat> So looking at the daily chart, it seems like a lot of people may have chased it at the high between 30 and 45 cents, and now they're temporarily underwater. This is probably happening across the cryptoverse where people may have chased projects. You know, this 10 x everyone chased it, smart money sells it, and then it comes off. I'm assuming there's going to be support at around 15 cents. Okay. But as with all of these small altcoins, while the boat rocks, uh, I would recommend checking our visual trends indicator, staying objective and trying to manage your emotions as best you can. All right. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Forrest, do you have any comments on Hedera Hashgraph? I'm not intimately familiar with it from a fundamental perspective, but I do remember searching through the Token Metrics YouTube channel and pulling up a video of, of Sam, our COO, doing a video on this like a year and a half ago. Old video, right? 80, it scored an 82% on the code review. 
Um, and I, I don't ex know exactly, you know, when the video came out that he was talking, but it was well in, into the bear market. And uh, it's, I think it's 10, 15, 20 X probably at least since he was originally talking about it. Uh, and, you know, anything code review over uh, an 80% or so is, is a really solid project. So um, can't speak for the near future on it, but uh, it, it looks good from, from a technical perspective. All right. Thank you, Forrest. So uh, back to Audius. People are very, very interested in Audius. <laughs> so the question is, hi, folks. I hope that you're good. Where do you see Audius and Perp by the end of the cycle? Thanks. Now, I know we recently had a video on Audius where I think we covered it recently. Uh, but I guess, Forrest, maybe an update on Audius and how that's doing. Then maybe we'll go to Bill for Perp. Yeah, so Audius was an interesting one here. Um, we did see... Uh, a lot of people seem to not want to get involved into Audius until after those tokens vested. I believe it was Friday, April 23rd. And it looks like the market may have priced that into uh, Audius's or Audio's price before they actually vested. And then a lot of buying pressure, uh, despite tokens vesting and supply increasing, a lot of buying pressure came in because I think people felt, felt feel more comfortable buying after a, di a dilution event. Uh, so we did bottom out uh, at, I believe, under $1.60 or so. This is kind of a, an averaged out price on CoinGecko here. Um, but it is uh, up overall, I believe, for the... No, it was up at one point. I think it was at $2.22 today. Bitcoin's bringing everything down right now, but um, we're back up at $1.91. I still think under $2 is a good buying opportunity for audio, um, under $3 eventually. But longer term price targets for this market cycle... I'm hoping uh, that we'll at minimum revisit five dollars, uh, where we topped. I think we topped at four ninety nine, um, and then I also have profit taking targets uh, around nine or ten dollars as well. And anything past that will just be, uh, you know, a, a great profit taking opportunity for me. Audio is a long term hold. Uh, if I have to hold it for for four plus years, I'm happy to do so because I think it's a really really good project. All right, thank you, Forrest. Now, actually, let me pull this up here. So. The visual trends indicator did turn bearish on Audius. Uh, this was April 20th, uh, actually. If we go to the high frequency one, it's also been bearish. Uh, so definitely worth keeping that in mind. Uh, this was bearish on the 9th at $2.35. Now, as Forrest just mentioned, uh, we're very, very bullish on this long term. Um, so if you're looking to trade it, maybe leverage the indicator, but if you're looking for maybe a long-term strategy. I myself, I'm bullish. Uh, I haven't bought any more right now. It's I think between two to five percent of my portfolio. Uh, I I have been hoping for it to dip some more to possibly buy some more, uh, but I'll keep you guys updated on that. Bill, what do you think about Perp? Okay, let's take a look. This has honestly been one of the biggest pain trades in crypto. So Perp was trading at seven. Uh, it launched on Binance. It went to 16. People tried to buy the dip at eight. And most recently, it looks like there was a huge give up trade and were run as it fell below six. So if you're holding this, not investment advice, but it looks like people have already given up. If that's true, PERP should recover if ETH holds in. I think if this continues to bleed, it's an especially with ETH in the green, it's an indication that something is wrong. However, it looks like people have just thrown in the towel. Just like what happened in Audius at $1.40, right? In other words, everyone gave up at the same time right into support and then it bounced. So the same thing could happen in PERP, okay? But it's going to require big cryptos to stabilize, say, within 72 hours. All right. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. I mean, um, actually, let me pull up uh, my screen here. Uh, I'm not sure what happened here. Why? It looks like, looks like my screen vanished. Uh, just give me one second here. So I'd like to pull up the visual trends indicator for PERP. And... It's not looking too good, unfortunately, right? Um, high frequency, 
turn bearish uh, on April 15th at 7.50 almost, and low frequency also turned bearish. Uh, now, I still have my perp. Uh, I'm staking this as well. I think staking it was paying out over 100%, I believe, last time I checked. So to me, I think it's it's a project I'm willing to hold for the long term, right? Uh, I don't have any plans to give up on it yet. <laughs> but uh, with that being said, definitely for the, for the traders, maybe not the best project. Okay. Uh, do you have any comments, Forrest? Uh, I'm not sure if you're trying to bring up your screen or something. Oh, nope, nope. Uh, no comments on, on perp. Okay. All right. So if you're enjoying the live stream, be sure to smash the like button, subscribe, and uh, turn on alerts. Okay. Let's go back to the show. Okay, so somebody's saying Ben has been frustrating me. It has been doing next to nothing <laughs> for many months. Do I just count it as a loss and move on or stick with it? All right, Ban Protocol. Uh, great question on this. Uh, Forrest, do you want to cover this? Uh, sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm just pulling up the, the price chart here. I'm, I'm on CoinGecko and um, it looks like it's in a bit of a correction, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it peaked pretty hard uh early you know august september 20, 2020 uh in that that initial wave and i guess it it feels like it's been doing nothing but it's been in a nice uptrend uh, if we pull up some some analysis some uh, trend line on it band usdt but we can probably just draw a quick trend line here uh and if anything uh it would appear that you know band is that a potentially good buying opportunity uh, as opposed to selling opportunity uh, now now personally i exit and enter and exit trades um you know among other things i like to use uh the visual trends indicator as well but i also like to draw these channels and right now when we're at the bottom of a channel um, that's usually a buying opportunity, whereas selling at the top of the channel is a selling opportunity. So it is still in a very nice uptrend. Uh, it just got way over, way too overextended in, in early 2020 uh, and is, has, has since been cooling off. Uh, it looks like it is butting up against kind of its all-time high here, uh, some resistance. Uh, but, I mean, for me, if I was ho holding band right now, uh, I'd be looking to, to hold through and, and maybe get out of it. Uh, once once it rechallenges the top of this this channel here, um, or taking a look at the visual trends indicator to to see where uh, band currently is, uh, we can do that if uh, Ian doesn't have it pulled up yet. Actually, yeah, I do. Yeah, I can. You do. Up here. Yeah. So yeah. looking at the visual trends indicator, it is bearish. However, this hasn't really been doing too well with this coin, right? Because looking at this. Um, the low frequency has a better ROI, actually, than the high frequency indicator, and actually better than than Hodling. So let's go to that one. So Band Protocol, yeah, it's also been bearish on this. And looking at this, so pretty much in the last one year or so, it was bullish at two forty four, got out at about eight bucks, then it basically went flat, went sideways, went bullish at seven forty one got out at about 12.48, and it's basically been up and down uh, since then. Uh, Bill, do you have any comments on on band protocol? Yes, just briefly, I, I think you guys have covered the charts. Um, I know I always say this, but if you have a bad feeling about your end, in other words, if you're like, should I just give up? I wouldn't use the words give up, but I would completely reevaluate why you like this trade to begin with. For, I'm looking at it here on my screen. Band shot up from 12 to 24 in a matter of a month. Okay. And then it turned around and came right back down again. That means bears took control, right? As soon as there was a rally. And when you see that in DeFi, Sometimes that means there's a better trade elsewhere. And based on the way you ask the question, you may know that deep inside. All right. Thank you, Bill. Okay. So let's go on to the next question. I'll bring, up, bring my screen back up. 
Okay, uh, I bought Coco's BCX at a dollar six cents. Is it still a good buy? And what do you think about SNX BTC? Uh, good question. Good question. So uh, maybe I guess one of you guys could pull up and do TA on that. I can also pull, pull this up on the visual trends indicator. So I'm fully out of SNX. Uh, I had a very small position that I've been in basically since August or September last year. And I was just basically providing liquidity on Uniswap as, as an LP. And that was pretty much it. it. Hasn't really done much. So I'm out of SNX. Actually, so let's first go to Coco's BCX. So I know our Quang grid was bullish on this for a while. Uh, but if we go to the visual trends indicator, now we do have a pricing uh, issue here. So let me change the timeline to be the last three months. So low frequency has been bearish uh, since April 15th at $1.20. Let me actually compare this strategy. Yeah, and then high frequency, we don't really have anything for this yet. Uh, Bill, uh, do you have any comments on Coco's BCX? Uh, I don't have any comment on that. Actually, uh, I'm saying for us, maybe he already has it up. Uh, uh, so I, I was unable to pull. Coco's BCX seems to uh, be having some some price, a big price gap on it. And I don't know yeah. exactly why this gap is there. That's crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, so <laughs> I can't really comment on this in, unless I understand why, why this is here. All right. Um, then uh, SNX. Let me actually pull up, pull that up here as well. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh yes, yeah. Let, let, so on on just about anything versus Bitcoin, um, synthetics look uh, versus Bitcoin in particular. Uh, it looks like it's dropped straight into a support zone, and really the entire market looks poised to do better than Bitcoin. This goes back to this idea that Bitcoin may be a millionaire's cryptocurrency and we may be in for a week where, you know, Bitcoin just doesn't do as well and other altcoins can either hold their ground, hopefully, or perhaps do a catch up rally. Mm -hmm. So SNX versus Bitcoin is in, is at support. All right. Uh, actually, uh, go ahead, Forrest. I see you have your screen up. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, Completely agree, agree with Bill here. Um, we saw synthetics, uh, this this more bullish trend line here that I'm going to color. We'll just call it red. Um, this red trend line here, synthetics broke below. Now, normally I'm a big fan if I'm looking for an entry point to, to buying on the trend line. Uh, but now synthetics has even dropped further below this trend line and onto this white trend line. Again, if if the bull market continues and Bitcoin can recover. And uh, to be quite honest, if we pull up Ethereum, because Synthetics is uh, an Ethereum-based project, Ethereum really hasn't even uh, flinched from this, this correction. We just saw Bitcoin trading 27% below its all-time high. And I know I've got a lot up on the screen here, um, but I mean, Ethereum's trading 13% below um, it's all time high. So synthetics being an ERC 20 token, uh, a, a good one at that, uh, a project that, that we like a lot and got a good code re technical review score, code review score. Um, I don't think this is the worst entry opportunity in the world. If the bull market continues now, you know, that being said, it's, it's, there's always risk. And again, maybe this is the time to kind of wait and, and, and wait things out, right? If Bitcoin goes down to 43K, obviously some of these altcoins can be dr driven further down. Um, so you know, right now, it's, I, I'm, I'm tempted to look more at things from a fundamental perspective and lean on the fact that, that Synthetics is a really good project. Um, and you know, long-term, we have to think, we have to think long-term in terms of uh, price performance. Okay, so comment here from King Nick, who's actually a customer. Hey, hey, hey Nick, what's up? Uh, he's saying uh, Coco's recently had a 1,000 to 1 token denomination plan, similar to when Polkadot's token quantity multiplied last year as the price reflected by dividing by 100. Okay, very interesting. Uh, great, great to know that. So actually, let me, let me also pull this up here on the site. So this is SNX. So SNX turned bearish as well uh, on April 18th. Um, then let me look at this. So looking at this, 
the high frequency strategy has had a better ROI than the low frequency and also compared to hodling. So let's go to that one. Looking at this. Yeah, so basically it's, it turned bearish at 19, 17 cents, uh, and it's been going down. And then uh, Jadal Quant did look into uh, SNX, and I think let me, he mentioned the correlation of this uh, is closely tied to Ethereum, right? So almost uh, 0.97 out of one uh, correlation with Ethereum. What does that mean? Uh, so basically, there isn't really any use in, ho in having SNX in your portfolio if you already have ETH, because it's basically moving the same way ETH is moving. So I think this also is one of the reasons why I got out of SNX because I have lots of ETH. <laughs> and if this is highly correlated with ETH, then there isn't really a point in terms of uh, holding this. Okay, uh, let's now move on to the next question. Once again, if you join this live stream, smash the like button, subscribe, and share this video with your friends. Okay, all right, so next question. Hello, good content as always. Could you please tell us how high could Zcash go? Their new scientific advisor group is awesome. Vitalik, Meller, uh, Breachman. Okay, we can pull that up. Uh, I'm saying, Force, do you already have it up? I'm seeing the screen here. Uh, I, I do have it up. Okay. Um, yeah, so here's the thing with, with Zcash and Monero, and, and we probably all saw that uh, the new coin, I think it was called Pirate Coin. That is another privacy coin that pumped very hard this week. I don't know what its price action has looked like or if it's fallen back out of the top 100. I haven't been keeping up with it. Obviously, I'm not chasing that pump. Um, but it, it's interesting uh, that I did not think... Uh, up until this point, that privacy co coins would be uh, a market narrative this cycle. Now, with this tax news, uh, and obviously I'm not condoning uh, evading taxes in any way, shape, or form, but uh, tax evasion is is one of the the uh, the things that gets brought up when when you talk about conversations with with Zcash and Monero and other privacy coins, right? So. Potentially, if we did see this tax bill come to fruition and it did pass, I would not be surprised to see some of these other these these privacy coins pumping. Uh, now, as far as how high it could go, um, Bill might be able to do some work with uh, his, his Fibonacci lines. Um, for me, I'm seeing it at a $300 top and 137 uh, or 167 rather uh, swing low. I was just doing margin buying pressure levels for this. I think uh, if it can get back up onto this trend line and rechallenge its all time high, this market cycle, if we continue to see bullishness, um, a next move, I would not be surprised uh, if it could go from 300 to 600. Now, obviously that, that requires, you know, the rest of the market to come back and, and rally. Uh, but from this swing low here at 160. We'll call it 170, uh, going back and rechallenging 300, and maybe making a move to 340, 2xing its swing low, um, you know, isn't out of the question for me. So uh, it's difficult to say as far as you know where could it go this this market cycle. Uh, in order to do that, I would I would need to build a scenario model like you've probably seen on this YouTube channel before uh, with the realistic price scenario model uh, videos, and I can add Zcash to that list if there's enough interest. Um, but hopefully we'll also have that, the ability to, to do those price predictions, uh, in an automated fashion, uh, soon. So. All right. Thank uh, you, Forrest. Yeah. Uh, Bill, any comments on Zcash? Yes. I'm bringing the chart up now. So this is the big question. If there's going to be a tax problem. Do you want to be the guy trading price coins when the guys that collect taxes go looking for the guys trading privacy coins? Something to think about. Uh, I think this has had a nice pump from 50 to 200. Um, I think if it holds, say, 209 and the whole market goes with it, it is possible that this goes to 507. Now, one note about coins that have privacy functions. I'm a big fan of Dash. There is a privacy function there. 
Zcash is probably known more as a privacy coin, but Zcash could also be considered the future of money. It is, after all, traded on Coinbase. Okay? So don't run away from something just because it's privacy. Okay? If it's some small altcoin and, you know, it has a name like pirate coin, uh, you know, that's not going to go over well with an auditor. But something like Zcash can be considered part of the future of money. So there is a way to play this, just play it smart. All right. Thank you, Bill. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go on to the next question. Hello, guys. Is Bill still holding alpha? Could it 5x by the end of this year? <laughs> okay. Uh, Bill, any update on alpha? Okay, Alpha has gone through a difficult period. Our view on that is it's recently gone through, you know, some very serious technical gyrations, but there have been some fundamental developments. I'm trying to pull up a chart now. Where the news that one of their technology problems had essentially been solved. Uh, the analyst who helped us develop this thinks that their tokenomics is better than a lot of other DeFi protocols. And there is a big 62% chart point at $1.13. Comes a chart now. Okay. So I think when it comes to alpha, as long as a dollar 13 holds, alpha is okay. I'm just going to label the chart properly here. As Bitcoin and a lot of these altcoins get washed out, there are going to be opportunities, particularly in DeFi, especially with the L with the advent of something called element protocol. Keep in mind with Alpha, Multicoin Capital from Austin, Texas is a big investor. So with this, I'm planning on being patient, particularly if a dollar thirteen manages to hold. All right. Uh, thank you, Bill. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Ian, Bill, and Forrest, are you still holding your altcoin positions? Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, for me, the only project I sold was basically um, SNX Synthetics. And the reason I sold that was I, I, I did officially for the first time in over a year, my, my first token sale investment. <laughs> so f we share this with our customers uh, on the pro plan. Uh, we're very, very bullish on a project called Integral uh, Dex. Uh, so I ended up investing in their token sale online, uh, and also began providing liquidity, right? So basically, uh, SNX wasn't really doing anything. So got out of, out of that to buy integral finance. Uh, but I only put in about 1% of, of my portfolio because although I'm bullish on this project, I think the fact that it's one, it's a token sale, right? I think it's still speculative and I would rather put in 1% and then look to possibly, possibly buy more once there's more price action and more history. Uh, in terms of other products I'm holding, I'm still holding uh, Armor Finance, Tornado Cash. Let me actually go through, go through my whole portfolio here, just to be fully transparent. Um, so, so basically, I'll go through this in terms of my largest holdings. So Ethereum, Matic, uh, I have that, I'm staking. Helium, no plans to sell that anytime soon. Falcoin, I still have that. That's done a 50x since I invested, I believe in the in the ICO back in 2017. Uh, I have some wrapped ETH for some DeFi stuff. Armor benchmark protocol still holding. Audius still holding. Perp I'm still holding. Siren I'm still holding. I still have some Chromia, although I've been trying to sell that on a regular basis, all the way dating back from their token sale back in 2018. Uh, that one did pretty well once they announced having NFTs uh, in the last few months ago. One inch I'm still holding, Desperate Finance I'm still holding, P Network I'm still holding, Hydro Finance I'm still holding, 
Opium, I'm still holding. Tornado Cash, I'm still holding. Uh, Lido, uh, LDO, I'm still holding. Uniswap, Airdrop, no, I haven't touched that at all. At all. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, and some stable coins for yield farming. I would say if I do plan to get out of any token, uh, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Uh, but if I did have to, I will probably downsize the number of projects I have that are exchanges because I just want to have lots of them in my portfolio. I have this, there's Opium, there's One Inch, there's Uniswap, there's Siren, there's Perp, right? But I'm willing to hold those for a while and just kind of let them pan out. Although Tornado Cash, Tornado Cash hasn't done too well, I think their tokenomics could be improved. Right now, it's basically a, a governance token that nobody wants to govern with. So it's pretty much a useless token at the moment. Just kind of being frank with you guys. Uh, I have been keeping up with what's happening in their forums to see if they are able to just offer more incentives to stake. And I think the adjustment I'm making going forward is really looking for products that are cash flow positive, right? Products that just print money, right? Such as liquidity finance. Uh, that's why I'm very bullish on it. And basically any project where you're earning uh, a portion of the fees in the protocol, I think those products will do very, very well. So that's kind of what I'm, I've been doing. Um, how about you, Forrest? Yeah, I'm still holding all of my altcoin positions. My profit taking strategy starts uh, with Bitcoin. Uh, I'll, I'll start taking some profits along with the market as Bitcoin hits hopefully around $70,000. Depends on how low we end up going. Uh, but I'll be starting to scale out of the market uh, as Bitcoin goes, if and when Bitcoin goes from around seventy dollars to $100,000. Um, I've got some, some key levels mapped out. Uh, for me, my largest positions are still, I own almost no Bitcoin. Um, I, like Ian, I'm, I'm on the Ethereum boat. My largest positions are uh, Ethereum, Audio, uh, and then we can go Nano, Polkadot, uh, and then after that it drops off in size, but Chainlink, Cardano, uh, and then uh, I'm also in liquidity as well, and I'll also be looking to take a decently sized position in, um, well, take that back. I was going to say a decently sized position in Integral, but because I'm in the U.S., I can't participate in the token sale, but I'm moving a lot of funds over to Integral so that I can start uh, providing liquidity and earning Integral tokens. And that'll be in the form of uh, providing liquidity on Ethereum and Chainlink and, and whatever else I can provide maybe like ethereum and wrapped bitcoin if i if i decide to buy some wrapped bitcoin at forty three thousand dollars or so but um yeah that's my portfolio all right awesome and for those who are asking about integral we did share this via a code review and also on the watch list to our customers so if you're a customer uh that email was sent out about a week ago i believe uh bill how about you are you still holding any altcoins and which ones? yes so i have two ways i do this the first one is the future of money trade, right? That's ETH, Dash, and Litecoin. Then, as with, you know, all these videos and a lot of the reports that we've sent out, you know, per and alpha, I'm keeping in the DeFi universe. I did successfully buy the dip in audio, right? And I'm going to try to hang on there. And again, with ETH, you know, ETH is probably, probably between now and August going to be the big trade in crypto along with Solana. If I sold any ETH, it would be to get into Solana just because it might just simply gap higher. Uh, I know that sounds crazy coming from the ETH maximalist, but that might be the only trade that I do. I'm going to try to hang in there on everything else and hope that this Bitcoin correction blows over in, say, a week or two. All right. Thank you, Bill. Uh, if you enjoyed this live stream, please smash the like button, subscribe and share this video with a friend. Tell a friend to tell a friend that not being in crypto is a financial crime. OK, let's go on to the next question. If you had to hold only three coins for a 10x in just three months, which ones would they be? Uh, this is a question we get all the time, <laughs> just in different formats. But basically, we're, we're looking at one quarter. If I had to pick three coins, uh, I mean, I would still pick Ethereum. I, mean, I know it's not the most popular answer, 
but I mean, as Bill mentioned, I think Ethereum is going to have a great summer. Um, and I'm obviously you guys can tell with the pillows here that uh, I'm an ETH maximalist here. <laughs> but I mean, I think Ethereum is going to have a great summer. If we had to go into the altcoin realm, I would say the products like I like I've mentioned before, Liquidity, uh, very very bullish on that. Um, has lots of functionality. Uh, we, we told our customers on the private webinar for professional customers that we think one of the new narratives in crypto would be capital efficient protocols and Li liquidity checks that box is capital efficient and it, it basically prints money tokens that print money uh, where you're earning fees right I, I mentioned earlier in the show that right now their apy uh, for anybody who stakes is over 800 percent and plus that apy is being paid out in a stable coin right so to me very very bullish on that uh market cap is still under 100 million but as we mentioned before, in terms of total value locked, it's already uh, ranked 13th and it's top 10 on Ethereum, right? So that's kind of like my low cap. Uh, as usual, Armor Finance, very bullish on it as well. I think that's something that's needed in this space. Um, if I had to pick one other project that I think could 10x in three months, um, Integral Finance. I mean, obviously right now, we don't really know what the market cap would be because the token sale, I think, has about two days left. But very, very bullish on that. They're trying to compete with Uniswap and Dodo and all those DEXs and SushiSwap as well. Um, they're basically also a more capital efficient protocol, right? So once again, capital efficient as the narrative. So I would say those are the three projects I think have lots of upside. And as I mentioned, this is my first token sale in over a year. I think probably since 2019. So almost, yeah, actually two years. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, when I do a token sale after two years, uh, I must really like the project. Uh, Forrest, how about you? Yeah, so if I had to 10x in three months, obviously the risk is going to go up. But uh, for me, I would pick Audio, Liquidity, and Nano. I'm very bullish on Nano. Uh, that being said, if I could participate in the integral token sale, I'd probably bump Nano out because it's a larger cap token and we're looking for a 10x here and I'd replace that with integral. Uh, if I just had to, to downsize to three tokens for a long-term hold, uh, not necessarily looking for a 10X, it would be ethereum.nano. All right, awesome, well, thank you, Forrest. Looks like uh, Bill's trying to reboot his computer and router uh, to see if we can uh, fix the issues we're having with the connection. Okay, let's go on to the next question. What are your, we've kind of already covered this. <laughs> Solana has been very popular, so I think we're gonna have to skip this. Okay, so next question, what coins would you hold through May? Ethereum or take 2x short on major altcoins? Okay, very, very interesting question. Uh, Forrest, what do, you what do you think about this? So, so the option is to either hold Ethereum or take a 2x, 2x short, short on major altcoins. Yeah. I would be holding Ethereum. Uh, I would not be shorting altcoins in the middle of a, a bull market, especially after is as big of a dip as we're in right now, I think going short now at the bottom, potentially the bottom of a dip, or, you know, maybe we go down to 43 K, maybe we go lower, uh, but I don't want to go against the macro trend and short, you know, short in a bull market, um, especially as bullish as I am on ETH. I think holding ETH is a no brainer. Yeah. I mean, uh, I agree as well. I think, I mean, cause pretty much we're all, I think probably on the same page and we're expecting, once the London hard fork for Ethereum happens, Ethereum will possibly become even more deflationary than Bitcoin. And I think that's going to cause lots of essentially FOMO in, into ETH. Uh, so very, very bullish on that. Uh, I myself don't short. Uh, I think it's, it's it's dangerous, especially for people who are new in crypto. So definitely, uh, if you plan to do any kinds of shorts, think twice. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I can show you guys why shorting just in general is dangerous in crypto if, if you look at the screen here this is total cryptocurrency market cap over the last seven years and it's on a linear trend line on a logarithmic view basically you would be shorting a market that has a hist a seven year history of going uh of, of exponential growth so it's like kind of kind of kind of dangerous playing with fire there yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's because I think the best story I've heard for shorting was Ugo. Uh, he was trying to short Tron TRX <laughs> one day, 
and uh, he basically took a bathroom break. And when he came back, Justin Sun had tweeted something that <laughs> sent TRX to and just wrecked everybody, right? And Ugo to to this day uh, believes Justin Sun was actually looking at the charts and timed his tweet to wreck as many people as he could. <laughs> so if you're in crypto, definitely be careful, right? Uh, when it comes to doing that. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. Okay, uh, do you think a bear market has started? If so, when do you think it will end? I mean, we kind of, we kind of answered this question in the beginning of the show, uh, but maybe uh, for us, do a quick recap. Yeah, absolutely. So to me, if we're looking at the crypto data and we're we're eliminating any sort of externalities such as the the Biden tax thing or the 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 the, the grid blackout in China that caused uh, you know bitcoin hashing power to drop and you know initiated this crash if we're looking at things just from a crypto market perspective it doesn't look like a top it doesn't look in term, like it in terms of a pattern and this is really the first red month we've had in total cryptocurrency market cap for the last seven months. Uh, when you go parabolic off an already exponential growth curve, people are going to take profits. Taking profits is, is completely natural. When you go from Bitcoin being three and a half thousand dollars a year ago in March to 60, almost $65,000, there, there just has to be uh you know, rounds of taking profits. It's completely natural. We're in the middle of 27% correction. Uh, 33 to 34% corrections are very common and arguably very healthy for a bull market. Um, for me, I don't think this is the beginning of a, of a bear market. Um, it very well could be. But again, when you only look at things from a, a Bitcoin and crypto perspective, it just does not look like it or feel like it. Uh, we haven't had the blow off top that we normally get yet. All right. And uh, Bill is back. Can you All hear right. us, Bill? Yes, I have you. All right. Awesome. So the question is, do you think a bear market is here? And do you th when, when, when will, will it end? So maybe to just kind of recap what you uh, talked about earlier with the market update regarding is this a bear market correction? Of course. So the answer is no, I do not think it's a bear market, right? A bear market is something that just continues to go down where the market's making lower highs and, you know, really hurting people. I think this is an example of something that is very, very common in bull markets where you have a margin call and you have what I call consensus positions getting attacked. So if every big institution has got too much Bitcoin and not enough Ethereum, then Bitcoin's going to go down and Ethereum's going to go up. It's that simple. So these pain trades are things that you see throughout different stages of bull markets. This is just kind of the margin call stage. Also, I think, like I said earlier, you have to deal with tape risk. So consolidation and moving back and forth is something that crypto players may have to get used to. It's common in legacy, but you know, crypto is used to all the way up, all the way down. I think there's a new middle ground, okay? And some of this choppiness will provide opportunity, okay? It would also provide opportunity to lose money if you don't manage your head right. So it's not a bear market. It's what I would call a consolidation phase. All right, well said, Bill. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next question. How does sell in May and go away affect your smaller holdings like Audius, Armor, and the future of money coins? Uh, LTC dash, etc. Uh, good question. I mean, so for me personally, um, as we mentioned earlier in the show, it basically means that in May, if if we think this correction lasts a while, you want to make sure you're in value plays. You're in, in, when the music stops playing, you want to make sure you're in positions that you're comfortable holding for a long time, right? So basically, if you're highly speculating and products you don't care about, in May, you, you, you basically go through and do a portfolio check. And ask yourself, why am I holding this? Is this something I'm comfortable holding if we enter a two or three-year bear market? The answer is no. In May, you should probably take some profits, cash out, and have a nice day. <laughs> right? So for me personally, everything in my portfolio 
uh, I'm fine holding. Uh, I would say the larger allocations. So armor, I'm fine holding that for years. Audius, I'm fine with that. Liquidity, I'm fine with that. Uh, I would say probably the projects that have weak tokenomics. So Tornado Cash, while well, the technology is great, uh, I'm hoping that the project can improve the tokenomics and give more incentives to token holders, whether it's through staking or launching some kind of incentive program. Uh, if they don't do that, then that I would have to really have a strong uh, talk with myself <laughs> to see whether I should hodl that. Uh, Forrest, how about you? Yeah, I'd echo pretty much everything you just said. Uh, what I c try to strive for is investing in good projects with good entry points. Uh, and what that means is is buying a project when it's potentially undervalued, but also buying or maybe you know maybe that's buying in a dip but also buying extremely good projects uh, the reason that's so important is because if we do go unexpectedly into a bear market which is completely possible um, you know we can do a lot of analysis but the, at the end of the day we can't control uh, a second wave of a pandemic coming we can't control uh, a tax rate tax rates getting hiked to 44 percent on capital gains right so if we do go unexpectedly into a bear market you're going to want to be invested in solid projects that are going to come back in the next bull market um, so for me audio token uh, that's that's one that i'm very willing to hold for a long period of time that being said this bull market continues and i have opportunities to take profits at 10x 20x or 30x of my initial investment uh, you can count on me taking some profits. Am I going to sell everything? Absolutely not, uh, because I want to realize you know long term gains. You know I want to realize hundred x, two hundred x gains uh, four or five years from now. But I'm definitely going to be taking profits if I have the opportunity to take those at at ten x or twenty x. All right, thank you, Forrest. Uh, Bill, uh, how about you? All right, going back to what I was saying earlier, how our long term portfolio models we're recommending 30% cash. Uh, it's as simple as this. As soon as the tax headline hit the tape, even though it's old news, I just went to 30% stable coins and kept my portfolio the same. I kept the same holdings. I just raised 30% cash and I'm going to just wait for opportunities. So I might make less money by, I don't know, waiting in May, but there's always a trade in crypto. <laughs> there's always an opportunity, right? It's we get on this show and we go, Oh my God, can you believe what's gone on this week? You know what I'm saying? There will be an opportunity. I just don't need to get caught in a margin call, particularly when our AI is, you know, saying, you know, having one third in stable coins from time to time may be a good idea. All right. Thank you, Bill. So if you're enjoying this live stream, be sure to smash the like button, subscribe and share this video with your friends. OK, uh, let's actually check in with the audience in the comments and see if there are any questions we can answer here. Uh, just give me one second. People talking about NFT hypes, uh, SafeMoon. <laughs> yeah, so SafeMoon was the that TikTok uh, meme coin that people were pumping. Uh, not anything I would personally hold uh, anytime soon. Uh, I cannot really see any major questions. I think we've answered most of the questions here uh, already. Okay, so let's go back to the actual AMA. Okay, is it better to dollar cost average or buy the dips? Uh, good question. Good question. Uh, Bill? What do you think? Okay, believe it or not, I am not a big fan of dollar cost averaging as a strategy all across crypto. Okay, if you're doing it in something that you believe in, like say ETH or Audius, that's one thing. But to use a dollar cost averaging strategy in a hot NFT coin, you know, if the coin goes from two cents to two dollars, and then you dollar cost all the way down, uh, your average price will be fifty cents, and the coin will be at zero. So you have to ask yourself, you know, buying the dip 
and having strategic levels and thinking, frankly, the way Forrest does about how you want to trade in and out, what levels you're using, et cetera, are the better way to go. You're going to do dollar cost averaging. You want to be doing that in high cap costs. But even in 2018, that was a little bit dangerous. So I'm a big fan of what they call active portfolio management, right? You buy dips when things get killed or, you know, when ETH is at 2,600 and bad news comes out, you raise a little bit of cash. That's how I do it. All right. Thank you, Bill. Forrest? Yeah, so I agree with Bill here. Uh, obviously, I, I actively manage my own portfolio, uh, but obviously you have people that aren't going to be willing or able to actively manage their portfolio well. Um, right? If your your you know grandfather or grandmother wants to get involved in crypto, how are you going to set them up? You're probably going to set them up to DCA. But if I had to oversimplify things, um, just very very bluntly oversimplifying the things, I would say in a bull market buy the dips in a bear market dca is not a bad strategy uh, when things are bottomed out and they're staying bottomed out for a long time that's that's a gross oversimplification um, but i i tend to to agree with bill um, active portfolio management is um, you know usually as long as you're okay with managing your risk and managing your greed and managing your fear and ma managing your emotions and you're not you know selling the dips and buying the tops then you're going to do better off actively managing a portfolio than uh, potentially just hodling or DCAing over time. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree as well. I myself don't really DCA. Uh, I think if you DCA, you can maybe DCA into crypto in general, but it could be different coins, right? Maybe just wiring funds from to your Coinbase Gemini account and buying ETH. I mean, like ETH DCA, I could possibly see myself doing that. But I myself don't haven't really done DCA since really 2017. <laughs> so, so one of those things, I think it's good for newbies and beginners to kind of get them to commit to being in crypto. But I think after a while, you kind of pick and choose what you want to get get into. Uh, so for, for me personally, uh, I could see maybe somebody DCAing into stable coins to yield farm, right? Just to earn extra yields. So something like that, I think makes sense. Um, okay. With that being said, uh, let's move on to the next question. All right. Are you still bullish on Litecoin and Polkadot? Okay, let's go to Bill, because I know Bill's been uh, talking about Litecoin a lot, and then we'll have Forrest cover Polkadot. Okay, the answer to the question is yes. Um, and I'll just go back to my original reasoning as I pull up the chart, right? Litecoin is going to be a way for new people to come into crypto. They're going to see it in PayPal. They're going to see it on Coinbase. Litecoin is essentially fast Bitcoin. It's not for sophisticated players necessarily. Okay. But, but, okay. It's going to be popular with the legacy crowd that will eventually come to crypto. Okay. This is a short term chart of Litecoin. Litecoin is currently undergoing like an ABC style correction. So if the margin call is over, then Litecoin, Dash, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum have all got upside. Why? Because they could be a component of the future of money, meaning a way for people to protect their purchasing power from inflation by buying simple cryptos in simple apps like PayPal. All right. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, Forrest, how about Polkadot? Still very bullish on Polkadot for a number of reasons. Uh, and you can also stake it for 12%, which is which is great. Um, Polkadot is very close to the, the parachain slot auctions for Kusama and then uh, subsequently for Polkadot. This is going to be a, a, a big demand driver for both Kusama and DOT. I'm not going to go too much into detail as to why this is a, a big deal, but essentially, if you are a Polkadot project and you want to be a parachain on the Polkadot relay chain, right? You want your project to be in the Polkadot ecosystem 
you have to bid uh, on one of 100 potential parachain slots. And what you do when, when those are auctioned off, the way they bid is they these projects bid with uh, however much DOT they own, as well as sourcing from a, a crowd loaning uh, from, from uh, supporters of that project uh, and people who own DOT, like you and I, can crowd loan to that project so that they can bid a higher amount for that slot auction. In return, uh, the crowd loaners, you and I, who are loaning out our DOT to be locked up for 12 to 24 months uh, for the lease of the of the lease duration of the of the DOT, uh, you know, the parachain slot. In return, we're earning whatever uh, project token that is. So if if PolkaSwap bids on a Polkadot uh, parachain uh, and you crowd loan to PolkaSwap, you'll get P swap tokens, right? So this is potentially going to drive demand for dot up exponentially because not only are all these projects going to be gathering as much dot and kusama as they possibly can so that they can be a parachain but people are going to see this as another money making opportunity where they can loan out their dot and earn not necessarily yield well yeah basically yield in the form of these uh you know uh dot or kusama project tokens so i think that's going to be a huge demand driver and we're very close to it uh, they're currently in testnet on the rococo testnet uh, and then the slot auctions are the very next thing in the uh, roadmap for polka dot could be a couple months uh, it could be sooner than we think all right uh, thank you forrest now i mean i think as, as mentioned before uh, polka dot i think is a great project great technology uh, litecoin <laughs> uh, as bill mentioned is, is i guess unpopular now for me, I would not personally uh, hold Litecoin long term uh, from a technology standpoint. I don't think there's much innovation happening. Uh, however, I mean, PayPal and all, all these new entrants into the space love adding Litecoin, right? Litecoin is on PayPal. Venmo added Litecoin recently, right? So I think for the foreseeable future, all these new big companies entering the, the crypto space will likely keep on adding Litecoin as a possible coin to purchase, which I think will give it long-term uh, benefits. Okay, uh, I think let's start to wrap things up. Once again, if you enjoyed, if you enjoyed this live stream, be sure to smash the, the, the like button, subscribe, put on alerts, and tell a friend to tell a friend that not being in crypto is a financial crime. Share this video with them. Uh, anybody you know in crypto who has any questions regarding the bear market, corrections, uh, hopefully we've been, been able to answer all those questions in, in the last two hours. Uh, so with that being said, uh, Bill, any last words to our crypto family? Yes, it's been quite the weekend. Uh, I'm sure there will be more headlines. Folks, at the end of the day, you want to have the ability to keep your head clear. That can mean different things for different people. If your head is clear, then when the opportunities arise, you'll just be able to calmly take advantage of them. So there's a lot that's gone on. There's always a lot that goes on. Make sure you remember to breathe and take care of yourself so that when the opportunities in crypto appear, you're there. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. So let's now go to Forrest. Forrest, um, any last words to our crypto family? Yeah, I'd like to echo something that Bill said in his market update and that I've, I've kind of touched on since then because I think he's absolutely spot on. Doing nothing is an option. If you're uncomfortable buying the dip, you don't have to buy the dip. You can always hold through it. Or if you don't have cash on hand to buy the dip, you don't have to buy the dip. You can, you can just sit and wait and hold through this dip. Now, do you want to sell the dip at this point? Maybe not. Not financial advice. Uh, usually, selling dips in a bull market isn't is a is a good way to to lose money, is, is unless you're catching it at the very beginning off of the news. Uh, but I just want to reiterate what Bill said: doing nothing here and waiting this out and waiting to see the way that this dip develops is a completely valid option. All right. Uh, thank you, Forrest. So, hold on, just asking for a second. Yeah. So, last words to, to our crypto family. We think one of the next new narratives are capital efficient protocols because DeFi has gone from basically a billion to over a hundred billion dollars. If you factor in other blockchains like, uh, Solana, uh, Avalanche and others. But I think the next trend, the next wave 
are protocols that can really give you one cash flow and then two that really do more with less right so i mentioned earlier the projects i like personally liquidity uh inter inter integral finance as well uh and i'm seeing both of them have those two narratives right they both are doing a lot more with less so integral is a dex that basically is more capital efficient than uniswap and sushi swap then liquidity is basically a lending protocol that's more capital efficient than MakerDAO. So I think those are the two big trends I'm personally watching and looking to invest in. Uh, with that being said, it was great having you all here. Uh, once again, uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Forrest. Great having you on. And as we like to say, we just landed on the moon and the lab The moon is not the limit to the moon and beyond. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.